Hi, this is Chris Paradise, and I'm here with the Tampa Bay Innovation Center. I'm the chair, and I'll be doing a little welcome for this B2B Accelerator Innovation Showcase, um, where we'll be presenting the companies, and they'll be actually being interviewed by a panel of experts so that you'll get to hear a little bit more about what the companies have done during the Accelerator program and what they're planning to do with their companies. So each of the business owners is very excited to be here, so I won't take up too much time. Um, Mike Mydell will be talking about the new building that we're building for the Tampa Bay Innovation Center, and that is in a very exciting project, and it's getting ready to get very close to groundbreaking now, and, and Mike will fill us in on, on what's going on with that. Um, Ken will be moderating the panelists and, and introducing the companies to you, and I would like to introduce to you Tanya Elmore, the president of the Tampa Bay Innovation Center. She is the one that keeps everything moving, she and her team. Um, and that means that really she keeps the budgets going and she keeps the, the, the walls and, and the lights on and is doing a, a tremendous amount of work behind the scenes on the new Innovation Center and the new building that's coming in. And all of that is very exciting. And I would just like to congratulate Tanya for the second B2B Innovation Showcase event. Um, this is our second class to come through, and I think this one was far better than the first one, um, even though the first one was very successful in live in person, and this one had to, had to uh, accommodate the challenges of uh, the COVID-19 epidemic and, and all of that. Um, that's really a, a huge, a huge reason for that is the work that Tanya and Ken put into this event and put into the Accelerator program. And, and also, I really have to congratulate the business owners who have been fantastic through the process and really have put in the work to make sure that they got the most that they could out of this Accelerator so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Tanya Elmore, the president of the Tampa Bay Innovation Center. Tanya, if you'd like to say a few words, that'd be great. Sure, thank you, Chris. Hello, everyone. I wanna thank you for joining us this afternoon. We're very proud to showcase the seven companies that graduated from cohort number two of the Innovation Center's B2B uh, Accelerator Program. These individuals and their teams have spent more than 100 hours over a 12 week period uh, working with the managing director here, Ken Evans, uh, with numerous mentors and community uh, partners um, throughout the uh, time period. Um, but, you know, what's really interesting about it is not only their dedication, but how they have grown over that time period. And you'll hear more about what they do and what they're um, moving forward to with their go-to-market strategies. In addition to the Accelerator Program, the Innovation Center runs numerous other programs to help entrepreneurs at the very earliest stages. We have a co-starters program that Chris is responsible for uh, facilitating uh, as a partnership with Pinellas County Economic Development and Creative Pinellas. We've graduated more than 150 participants to that program over the last few years. Additionally, we have a dedicated coaching program for those uh, founders that really want to hit benchmarks and to grow faster. And then we have numerous other programs like our product discovery chat, coffee chat, session and tech talk. And of course, we couldn't do any of it without our team here at the center, our board of directors, and our key sponsor, uh, Pinellas County Economic Development. So now it's my pleasure to actually introduce you to Mike Mydell. Hey, Mike, I want to thank you uh, for your sponsorship, support, participation. Um, without it, you know, we would not be able to put on the exceptional program and programs and networking events that we have been able to do to help create jobs within our community. Thank you for investing the time and resources to help recognize and appreciate our graduates today. And of course, we look forward to working with you and your team in the brand new Innovation uh, Center. Thank you, Mike. Terrific. No, thank you. Uh, glad to be here today and glad to be a partner with Tampa Bay Innovation Center. Um, Pinellas County Economic Development is actually a department of the county government. And that's kind of rare with an economic development organization. But in a county like Pinellas, where we're nearly completely built out, and a lot of the effort we have on economic development is in creating space for entrepreneurs, for business owners, for manufacturers to locate and to grow. And uh, so part of that effort is the new Tampa Bay Innovation Center incubator, 
And we went after a, and achieved a seven and a half million dollar grant from the U.S. Economic Development Administration to help us to build a 45,000 square foot purpose-built state-of-the-art incubator. And this will be located at the southwest corner of 11th Avenue South and 4th Street in St. Petersburg's Innovation District. So this is just south of downtown. It uh, borders the University of South Florida's business school and, uh, and a future and their current wet labs, a future academic building. It's very near the uh, um, Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital campus, uh, very near NOVA's uh, laboratories out on the, in the old power plant from uh, Florida Power Days. So it's, it's right in the heart of the innovation district. We look forward to, uh, to a groundbreaking next July. On October the 6th, we will have a, uh, the Board of County Commissioners will be approving the contract with BEC uh, to be our design um, agency for this. And this process, the federal government requires design, bid, build. So BEC in this case will be just our architect, but they will be working directly with Tanya, with my staff, and then with the community as a whole to identify uh, the design and the programming uh, to some extent, how that design interfaces with our programming um, at this new center. So we're right on the edge of, a, of an exciting time in uh, Pinellas County in the Tampa Bay area, because uh, already uh, Tanya's uh, Innovation Center is pulling clients from throughout Tampa Bay. Uh, this will really put us on the map nationally. It'll be a, a truly unique facility and we look forward again, Tanya and the Tampa Bay Innovation Center will be the operators of this new incubator and uh, we'll be working closely with her in uh, making that a success. Um, with that, I just want to congratulate again uh, all of the founders who took part in this exhaustive self-evaluation, uh, working through uh, your ideas and concepts, identifying who your customers are. It's, it's a major process and obviously you put a lot of hours, but a lot of uh, stress and, and anxiety and thought and, uh, and money into the process. And so we thank you for that and we look forward to hearing your ideas and being partners for, with you as you grow into the future. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Ken. All right, thank you, Mike. We appreciate the kind words and the ongoing support of you and your team at Pinellas Economic Development. Uh, hi, my name is Ken Evans. Uh, I'm the Managing Director of the Innovation Center's uh, Accelerator Program. And thank you all for attending today to come celebrate these seven companies, the startups that have taken the, uh, the last 12 weeks of their busy schedules to come and learn more about uh, the startup world and the journey of actually building a company and building a product. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to talk about the program uh, before we get started with those founders and just give you a little bit of insight as to what these uh, these companies have endured for the last 12 weeks. I have 30 plus years of technology uh, industry experience uh, delivering enterprise B2B type products. And I'll be the first to admit that that bias is my approach to building the curriculum for this program. I want people to be focused on building products that are actually going to make a difference, that are going to be revenue producers, job producers, um, good PR buzz producers for this region. Um, so these seven companies have endured 12 weeks with me going through workshops every single Wednesday for pretty much a full day uh, that were hyper focused on customer discovery and validating that their business was addressing a problem worth solving. I think uh, every one of these companies uh, uh, going through this approach had at least one, if not several, aha moments for the founders and encouraging them to go back, connect with early adopter customers, um, in, in, uh, in, in endure a lot of no's, a lot of negative feedback as well as positive feedback to make sure that they were focusing on a product that really needs to be built. So many startups end up building companies and products that don't get traction. And that really is almost half of the failures that we see in the startup world of building a product that really isn't needed. So being hyper-focused on that, going back and connecting with those customers over and over again, I'm sure they got tired of me saying it, was really something that helped them build their credibility with those customers and their confidence that they were building something that was a truly scalable uh, revenue producing product. So uh, with that, I would actually like to have uh, um, thank the um, many people that made this program possible. Uh, I created a curriculum that helped them understand some of the basics on customer discovery and validation, but we had many industry experts coming in to help us. Uh, those are industry experts that I selected based on, they were either focused on product, 
They were focused on revenue. They were focused on operations. And last but not least, they were also focused on delivering a great message around leadership. This can be a stressful journey. The, the, the startup journey uh, requires a lot of time and attention and a lot of treasure. Uh, so you need to be in it for the long haul. It's going to take its toll. So we, we made sure that we were focusing on founder wellness. We made sure we we're focusing on the things uh, that these founders could use for years in their career going forward and finding the right people to recruit to their team, to grow their team, to grow their product, connect with customers in a meaningful way, and really become a scalable entity. So I'd like to thank all of those companies that were, uh, all those individuals that participated as guest speakers, usually two or three every single week. And uh, as the slide you see up there uh, next, the entire community that was behind this effort, the companies that, were, that those uh, individuals represent, and the effort that they put into supporting this program, not just in the first cohort and the second cohort, but really committing to supporting this program in the long haul and making sure that we grow as a community, as a tech ecosystem, we really make tech a key part of what our local economy is going to look like. Uh, with that, I'd like to have uh, Tanya add the panelists back in so we can talk uh, about the, uh, the companies that are uh, going to be presenting, the seven companies. Uh, they'll each get about 90 seconds to 120 seconds, so a less than two minute snapshot of what the company's doing. I'm not going to bore you or they're not going to make you endure long slide decks. They've each been given one slide to represent their company and 90 seconds to talk about it. So that hyper brief uh, um, uh, presentation will be followed by five or six minutes from our key panelists. Uh, and they will be asking questions about the companies, about the experience in the accelerator, and what, is, uh, what these companies are ready for in the next steps. So, with, but with that, I'd actually like to have the panel introduce themselves, uh, give me 30, 60 seconds on who they are uh, and uh, their participation in the event today. So, Travis, uh, I'm going to start with you, if I may. Sure. Uh, thanks, Ken, uh, and thanks, Tanya and team. Great to be here. Uh, my name is Travis Milks. I'm uh, a managing partner with Topmark Partners. Uh, we are a uh, growth equity investment firm headquartered here in Tampa Bay. We've been here since 1999. Uh, we actually recently rebranded. We we're formerly known as Stonehenge Growth Equity Partners. Uh, certainly great to see a lot of familiar faces on, on the slides, Ken, that you just, uh, and names on the slides that you just uh, put through. Um, longtime supporter of uh, the Innovation Center, like a lot of folks uh, around the table and on this call, and excited to see all the progress and things that the, that the companies have made here in the last 12 weeks. Uh, our firm focuses on technology-enabled businesses located in Florida and across uh, really the Southeast United States. Uh, we're currently investing out of our third fund, and these are businesses typically that are at the growth stage uh, with sort of two to three million dollars in, in revenue. Um, and up. We focus on uh, typically B2B uh, related opportunities, again, that are in uh, a mode to scale, and we're typically investing two to, two to seven million dollars uh, in each portfolio company in which we uh, invest. And kind of over the last 20 years, we've invested in 45 companies, uh, 20 of those located here in Florida. Excellent. Thank you very much for participating. Joy, uh, you're up next. Awesome. Um, well, thanks very much for having me. So I have uh, known Ken and Tanya. I think I've known Ken forever, uh, somewhere along that line. It, it seems like that anyway. Um, and known Tanya since I moved to the area. It's great to see what the organization has accomplished um, over the years. And I'm excited about this particular accelerator because I believe there's been a lot of effort put into actually building real companies with real products. And I think in our community, we often uh, get sidetracked by what is a technology company and what is a professional services company. Um, so, you know, technology companies actually make technology and professional services companies implement those technologies often. Um, there's nothing wrong with being either one, but confusing the term becomes problematic, particularly from an investor's point of view. So I have New Market Partners, which is my own fund, and I invest from that fund, uh, that portfolio. Uh, we make early stage investments up through series A um, investments. And uh, I also work with several venture capital firms um, as a part of that. Um, I have worked with several hundred founders throughout my career and in building my own companies have raised over $350 million um, from everything from angel investors up through uh, venture capital 
And then I've been brought in by the private equity guys to help write the ship on numerous different occasions as well, or fill in as an executive. So I'm looking forward to today to seeing what some of the, uh, how far the companies have come since my first interaction with them early in the cohort. All right, thank you, Joy. Thank you for being here. Mark, you're up next. Mute, Mark. Mouse problems. Um, I'm Mark Swanson. I'm uh, also looking uh, forward to hearing everybody's presentation. Uh, I was one of the uh, presenters and, um, and coaches early on, and I haven't talked to you guys in a while, so I'm really excited to see how far come, uh, you've come along in bringing your great ideas, I thought, uh, t towards fr fruition. Um, my background is a, like uh, Joy is a serial entrepreneur. I've done four venture-backed startups. I've um, had three exits, two of them very nice, um, and one of them not so good, uh, which is the path of an entrepreneur. Uh, I'm currently an investor and a uh, consultant with Lane 5 Ventures, and I've invested in uh, over a dozen startups over the last few years, both in Tampa Bay and around the United States. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing how you guys progress and seeing if uh, there's any opportunities there. Thank you. All right, thank you all for joining us as panelists. Uh, we look forward to your questions. Uh, so with that, I will bring up the first of our seven companies. Uh, Cesar Morales is the founder of Ceres Engineering, which is a supply chain logistics and risk management company. Cesar, welcome to the virtual stage. Thank you, Ken. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Cesar Morales. I'm co-founder of Ceres Engineering. Uh, we are a software company that develops forecasted flood data for supply chain risk management. Now, flooding today is one of the largest and most impactful uh, weather events you'll find, and it comes at a cost of $56 billion a year to U.S. industries. Yet the technology that develops that flood data still is limited to only providing the probability of risk of that flood rather than detailed uh, descriptions of the risk itself. Now, my co-founder and myself have a background in developing data analytics platforms to the Department of Defense, and we saw an opportunity to create a solution to this problem, leveraging our experience in this arena. And what we built is a technology that combines cloud-capable analytics software with enhanced data models that goes beyond probability of risk, but provides where and when that flooding will occur as a result of a real-time weather event. So tonight's storm and providing the data on tomorrow's flooding. If you are a company like Amazon or Walmart that depends on consistency and predictability in the movement of your goods, then it's not enough to know if a road will flood, but you need to know exactly where and when that flooding will occur and how it'll interrupt your, op your operations and your continuity, your business continuity. And that's what we do. We provide data and give you a crystal ball to see where that problem is. But more importantly, we provide predictability and foresight on that risk so the companies can take the right actions at the right time to mitigate that risk. Now with our prototype built, we're engaging with the supply chain risk management technology sector and the investors in those technologies to help define our market entry. And we've seen interest from insurance and reinsurance firms that see the potential in shaping our capabilities into a tool for their marketplace. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Caesar. Uh, I, I will let you folks figure out who wants to answer the first, ask the first question. Uh, go ahead. I'm not going to go round robin on this. Um, I'll go. So um, I actually know a little bit about this particular space. So help me understand, um, I, I get the importance of what you've put together. Um, when it comes to your go-to-market strategy, you mentioned partnering with other people who were in the BCP arena, right? The business continuity planning arena. Um, who are you calling on? At what level, I guess, are you calling like in, in kind of making your entry into that? Because from a logistics perspective, right, it gets very mucky and, you know, it can kind of, you can have a really, really long sales cycle or a really, really short sales cycle. So I'm just kind of trying to understand. Sure. We focus on supply chain, supply chain risk management technologies because we know that supply chain is forward leading as early adopters of technology. And there's an emergent sector specifically for supply chain risk management and further for weather-based risk management. 
So mm -hmm. we've contacted the leaders of those platforms. A couple of them are, uh, are, are new companies themselves and discuss their capabilities and how they work it in the marketplace. And we found that you know, there is a demand in that market for weather-based risk management technologies, and there's also a space for predictive analytics in that space as well. So we have contacted uh, the chief technology officers of several of those platforms, and we've engaged with several uh, supply chain risk-based venture firms uh, to see the, you know, both sides of the equation and how we can assist in, in adding our capability as an additive to their platform. Okay, so just just for uh, okay, I think you answered it there at the end. So you're looking to integrate with them and have them be an extension of your sales organization. So in other words, you'll sit in the back end. You want to feed the platforms they've created and have them be the sales force in the market. Correct. Correct. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Teaser, uh, what do they do now? Uh, your potential customers to alleviate the risk of uh, floods and and road blockages and stuff. So several of the larger firms, logistic firms in the country, DHL, CH Robinson, have either built their own platform to integrate existing uh, weather data, aggregated data, and overlap it with the movement of their, of their goods. Uh, and it's basically just aggregation of data as a layer on top of their supply chain. Uh, what, what is enhanced, what we bring to the market is an enhancement of that. So instead of telling you where the flood is today, and that's where the technology is, we could tell you where the flood will be tomorrow to allow them to do things like route optimization, to, to change the inventory plan, to either go before or after that weather event, then to, you know, to support their business continuity. So today, the best you get is where the flood is right now, but there's very little in providing where the flood will be tomorrow for route optimization and business continuity. Okay. For, for in that maybe an extension of Mark's question, Caesar, you know, to that point for your early customers, how, how are you showing them the accuracy? Are you showing simulated um, events? Are you how are you giving early folks confidence in the accuracy and attribution of the of the predictive modeling? Yeah, that's a great question, and it's a tough question. And predictive modeling today is based on simply the, the foundation of the data that you have. So what we use as an input is a forecasted precipitation for either from NOAA or another weather service. And our output is based on the accuracy of that forecast. So, so we have a dependency there on the input data. Our modeling, uh, if we see an inconsistency in historic data that we modeled against, what we do is we calibrate our model on the new data. So, on data analysis, we're, do, we're continually calibrating when we get new events and more data to refine our model. But there is a dependency on the input data and its accuracy, and that's the rain forecast we get from weather services. Yeah. Okay, thanks. All right, um, time for one more question, if anyone has one. Have, have you done any uh, market validation with the, in terms of pricing with how much uh, extra people would be willing to pay uh, for your service if, since you're really providing an enhanced service to what they already are getting? Sure, uh, you know, our, our market strategy is to begin and get a foothold in the market as an attitude, attitude to an existing platform. So for example, there's a company called Risk Pulse that just got acquired by DHL and Risk Pulse provides uh, enterprise packages to different firms and actually the only data I got for out of this is a contract they have with the government at $150,000 uh, a year for for their enterprise services we believe if we're an additive we could we'd be an additive at 20% of that value to the customer and once we get that foothold we could grow in our value for them and, and that's been our, our, our strategy right now to get a foothold and the best we've seen as pricing in this market. All right, great. Caesar, thank you very much. Um, we'll uh, demote you back to attendee and I'd like to welcome Luke to the virtual stage. Uh, Luke McGinn with Elite Recruiter is, uh, uh, has built an HR tech, hiring tech uh, platform for technical managers. Luke, welcome to the stage. 
Hi, Ken. Thanks. Uh, hello, as Ken said, my name is Luke. I'm a co-founder of Elite Recruiter. Our software helps tech-driven companies leverage workflow automation to build better teams faster. The problem we're solving? Hiring software is currently built for HR and recruitment professionals, not technical managers, and many small to mid-sized companies simply do not have these employees. Over seven years of building core product teams for enterprise technology companies, I noticed how software solutions for hiring underserve technical managers particularly in agile team settings where administrative time burden and opportunity costs adversely affect product development. The baggage of HR-centric hiring software routinely outweighs the benefit. The average interview life cycle for a software development position takes 40 days to complete, while the best candidates are typically off the job market 10 to 20 days after initial contact, making it crucial for lesser known companies to process their candidates quickly. In response, we're building agile hiring software that adds structure and repeatability to the process by automating workflows and streamlining interview coordination to eliminate repetitive and manual administrative tasks that delay the hiring process. The market for hiring software is growing at 7% year over year and is expected to reach 3 billion by 2025. RPO services comprise a $5 billion market where companies outsource management of the recruitment function in whole or part to a third party. Over the past 90 days, we've completed 40 interviews with potential customers, all technical leaders within the respective company, when compared with Greenhouse, a Series D competitor that's raised $110 million in funding. A CTO we recently interviewed described Elite Recruiter as much better and more intuitive. Over the last 12 weeks, we've been able to move through customer discovery and product validation quickly and thank Ken and TBIC for all their support and time investment. We're planning a V1 soft launch for February 2021 and have 10 companies committed with five open spots remaining. To fill these, we welcome introductions to organizations who are interested in exploring new ways to hire more efficiently. Thank you. Oh, excellent. Uh, thank you, uh, Luke. I appreciate that. Um, uh, let's see, Joy went first last time. Mark, do you want to go first this time? Yeah, sure. Um, so since Greenhouse is your main uh, competitor, could you uh, talk to me about a, like a, an example um, in, a hire, in the hiring process where you would, uh, your product would outshine uh, Greenhouse? Yeah, so uh, I mean, I'll, I'll qualify that statement. So they're, they're our main com uh, competitor in like a, a later, I think, phase. Uh, early on, I think our competition is, is more so non-competition because a lot of, uh, you know, startup companies and SMEs don't, uh, you know, may not have, have actually adopted a solution yet. But what our software does better, I would say, is just like it eliminates uh, repetitive and manual administrative tasks that are like frequently found in, in hiring software. It's, it's mainly built for HR professionals. So, you know, the thought of like automating workflows, much like a JIRA, uh, you know, is, is kind of second thought. So, so this is uh, uh, less is more for these type technical hiring people, right? Yes. Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, so assuming based on kind of how you've defined this, it's basically a card based system. It's an agile system for HR. Am yeah. I uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's perfectly put. It's, it's a, uh, uh, you know, dr drag and drop uh, candidates across uh, an interview process board that triggers automated actions. So do you also integrate with things like if I wanted to, so very typical, right, in hiring developers is pulling GitHub accounts and things like that. So have you, in the, in the system, do you have a way to kind of pull that data in, even if it's a manual cut and paste initially? Yeah, no, we can definitely pull that data in. And, you know, it's like at, at this point, we're kind of working on it, I, I think, the more base level uh, uh, workflows. And, but, you know, I think our plans definitely extend into that and, and our engineer, he's become much more involved in these product conversations because suddenly uh, we're building something for, you know, uh, technical engineering managers oftentimes and his input has been really uh, valuable. Yeah, I, I think, so if I offered you a suggestion, I would say in that area, that would be pretty important is the ability to just kind of pin GitHub counts and things in there because if you're hiring a, you know, a development team or a member of a development team in that case, that's going to be one of the first things you go and look at. And then generally the next task that's given is a problem solving task as a part of that. So I'm going to, you know, a CTO or whoever's hiring, making that hiring decision is going to create a series of problems and we're going to kind of score people 
on how they perform. So being able to just kind of add those things into your card-based system, it actually makes perfect sense. And the cool thing about it, I think, based on what you said, since I haven't actually seen the product, um, is that now it would be able to travel with that employee once they're brought on board. That, that's a pretty big deal from a dev team perspective to be able to figure out how to flex my team um, in the development space. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, Luke, great job. Um, what, what's just kind of the average, um, you know, sort of target size of an organization that you guys are going after? How, how big of a technical team or how big of a company do you think is sort of the sweet spot for you guys? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, you know, I'll admit I was, uh, um, you know, a, a bit surprised by like a lot of our research. Um, you know, we were kind of, we started off with really strong assumptions, uh, you know, about who would want this and who wouldn't. And, um, like initially we were, we were targeting companies anywhere from like 25 to, to 50. And this is like for the early market. And um, we were having really good conversations with them. And then as some other companies started kind of coming up um, um, where, you know, the engineering team may, may have only had like two or three people and the company, you know, like maybe comprised of 10 total employees. Um, I, I never really thought that companies of this size would want elite recruiter or think it's valuable, like, because, you know, the, the, like the more people that, that, you know, are in an organization, it's like, that's, you know, a lot that it creates a lot more touch points just to organize hiring, scheduling interviews or whatnot. But based on our research, like even these smaller teams that they, you know, they thought it was a very viable solution and some have even signed up to participate in the uh, soft launch. Okay. So, so you do think you, you still think it would be if, if you were to say, hey, our first 10 prospects would be X or the people that have signed up in the soft launch. Is it a mix of those uh, types of profile companies or is it more? Yeah. So so I, I would say on average, it's about 20 employees, 25 employees. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Which is manageable for us. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thanks. All right. All right thanks. Uh, any final questions from the panel? Or are we good? Great. All right, Luke, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have uh, Gianna Whitfer with Lease Honey, uh, which is a mashup of a real estate play along with an ag tech play. And I'd like to uh, welcome Gianna to the stage. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yep. Awesome. So, hi, everyone. My name is Gianna Whitfer, and I'm the founder of Lease Honey, a marketplace that matches beekeepers and landowners to help landowners save money on their real estate taxes while saving the bees. Um, I have a background as a marketer in the tech and cybersecurity industry and in commercial real estate investment and development. Um, I've helped grow and scale a local real estate development firm to 2 million in own square footage in the state of Florida alone. Um, but my real true passion is, of course, bees. Um, every year, 125,000 beekeepers and their bees pollinate over 15 billion worth of U.S. crops. And beekeeping as a hobby in an industry is growing by almost 10% year over year. Um, in the top three biggest states for bees, Florida, Texas, and California, there are an estimated more than 40,000 beekeepers working their hives. However, with the growth of beekeeping and with the growth of sweeping urban renewal and redevelopment projects, there is less land for bees now than ever. Um, urban and rural beekeepers can't find land or they can't find the suitable land. This inhibits new beekeeping operations from starting and is detrimental to existing operations growth. Um, beekeeping is a vital and essential industry for a food supply chain. Um, and at the same time, there's an underutilized incentive in many states. Bees count as livestock, you know, the ag part. <laughs> and placing bees on your land can or may save a landowner 80% off their market rate real estate taxes. Um, with real estate prices skyrocketing, this provides CPAs and lawyers an opportunity to save their clients on taxes and helps preserve our agricultural spaces. With over 550 members to date and current discussions with CPAs in the local Florida market, Lease Honey is aiming to create a win-win for our pollinators and for our wallets. Thank you. Thank you, Gianna, appreciate it. Um, okay, Travis, can you go first this time? Sure, um, I mean, I may have missed this. Can you tell me, is there a, uh, what kind of the core offering here is? Are you, is it a platform that matches these parties with each other? Or I, I didn't miss, I didn't I miss exactly how you're delivering this. Yeah, so it is a platform that matches beekeepers and landowners. And I yeah. feel like this, 
goes uh, pretty naturally into how does it make money, um, which I can also answer. Um, so there are a lot of revenue opportunities here, um, and the main one being a percentage of the real estate taxes saved by the landowner to lease honey. Okay. There are other ones too, you know, ad, ad revenue, um, you know, even the beekeeper paying uh, to find land, but that's the main one that I discovered to go after in this program. And, and sorry, just real quick, how, how, so how big do you see this scaling in the next three to five years? Yeah, so in the next three to five years, so um, currently in this market validation and awareness phase, um, I'm working and speaking with lawyers and CPAs on the model. Um, I, because in uh, Florida, you have to um, enter into this sort of, uh, uh, you have to get started on the process of starting your agricultural land exemption um, in January. I'm hoping to start with one um, uh, deal done this year only. But over the next couple of years, it could be scaled um, as long as the, um, as long as there are enough beekeepers and landowners who need it. Thanks. Oh, wait. oh Mark, go ahead. Yeah, uh, G Gianna, does your software provide uh, any guidance or links to um, the farmland tax laws in different states or counties, I guess it would be, right? Yeah, so I'm starting in Florida. Um, I, the marketplace uh, accepts people from all over the country right now. We have about 40 states represented. Um, but yes, I'm going to be um, going forward. Uh, it'll be part of Lee Sunny to help and assist the landowner with understanding and getting those tax uh, tax credits. Um, so are you contacting the landowners directly? I guess uh, I'm, I'm not super clear on the go to market strategy on exactly mm -hmm. how you're getting to the target customer. So right now the marketplace is comprised of 70% of landowners and 30% beekeepers. And I've done um, essentially zero marketing. Um, people are searching for the solution on their own and coming to Lee Sunny. Um, in the future, I do plan, once I've got this all approved out, I do plan to do direct mail campaigns out to landowners as well as CPAs and lawyers um, who are involved in real estate. Okay. Okay. Um, that's, pretty, that's pretty amazing. Honestly, if you had that many people come in and you haven't actually done anything. I'll, I'll, I'll say that. I've done some, I, I've done some things. I've been in this program. <laughs> Let me not say that I haven't done no, anything. But like the bulk of the people are coming in via search engine optimization, via search for ag tax Gianna, savings with fees. Jenna, what are the requirements for the landowner uh, to, to be involved? This is so fun. Um, uh, <laughs> it depends on what county you're in. Um, so every county in every state in the country is different regarding their laws um, on this specific topic. Um, for most, you cannot have this be your residential property. So unfortunately, you can't put hives on your, on your front lawn and have it count as a farm. Um, but other than that, um, you know, it has to be a bona fide commercial uh, uh, beekeeping operation on your property to count. Okay, great. Any other questions from the panel? So yeah, I have a question. So in that scenario, could you then subdivide your property? Because I, I happen to have a friend who grows a bunch of black walnut trees in Georgia. It's an interesting mm -hmm. thing. Very similar kind of scenario. Um, I'm like, like literally thousands of them on the property. So I'm assuming you could subdivide your property as he has done in, in that scenario. If you had the, if you had that much acreage. Yes, although I do not think Lee's Honey will do that for you at this point. <laughs> no, that's okay. But I mean, I, I, but I think there's an opportunity there was my point. Okay, got it. All right, great. We had, uh, we had one other question from one of the mentors. Uh, Gianna, could you be a little bit uh, more clear about is it an app? Is it a service? Is it a platform? How would you characterize the product? It is a marketplace. So it is a, right now, a desktop application. Um, Eventually, I'd hope for it to be an app. Um, so I think you could see on my slide, Airbnb, that is the model of uh, what I'm going for in terms Excellent. of 
I, I love it. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. So next we have uh, Thomas Westberger, Westerberg, sorry, uh, from Mango Signs. We're going to be talking about digital marketing and digital signage. Thomas? There we go. Hey, thank you, Ken. Can you hear me all right? Yep, just fine. Start whenever you're ready. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tom, the founder of Mango Science. With recent world changes, investments in restaurant menus, hospitality, and retail have changed forever. Now more than ever, it is essential for brick and mortar businesses to communicate while keeping their customers and employees safe and engaged. Having worked in the digital signage industry for many years, there are a lot of great solutions out there. The problem was that all of them required significant upfront costs, long-term contracts with egregious maintenance plan, proprietary hardware, and an in-house IT staff to handle the on-premise hosting and network configuration for these devices. This made powerful and dynamic digital signage unaffordable for more, most businesses, especially small businesses. Mango Science solves this problem with an easy to use software as a service platform that eliminates upfront costs using hardware that is readily available, no long-term contracts, and pay as you go. We are a secure cloud-based platform, so all you need is internet access and a compatible smart TV or a device connected to your TV. Think of us as the Wix of digital signage. Seeing the huge benefits of digital signage and how it can help small businesses communicate, as a side project, we created an MVP and made it available to customers in 2015. Within the first month, we've secured our first paying customer and have been expanding the platform and gaining customer traction ever since. We have over a thousand companies actively using our platform from Fortune 500 companies to your mom and pop corner store. The market is ready for digital signage. In 2016, the digital signage software market was valued at 4.48 billion and is expected to reach 9.24 billion by 2023 at a continuous growth rate of 10.2%. With recent events, the need for digital signage is even greater to keep customers and businesses safe. Digital signage is not the new normal, it's the next normal. If your business or a business you know could benefit from digital signage, please reach out, we'd love to help. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, I think we're back to the top of the order with Joy as the first question. Joy, do you have a question for Thomas? Sure, um, so I made an investment in a digital signage company, it didn't go well. Um, <laughs> I hear that a lot. <laughs> I, I was in that same company. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't go well. I think there's something like, how did I turn $25,000 into $2.50 or something? Yeah. Like um, but it, it wasn't due to lack of the product functioning or to the lack of the management team um, at the end of the day. So what I'd love to hear is how this solution really differs from the other solutions on the market. And just for clarity, you did say you started in 2015, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so yeah, yeah. so you tell me how you are different than the other ones. I see the logos, it's impressive, I, I get it. What makes you different and unique from those other companies that are out there? Sure, so we started this um, back in 2015 and you know, started development on it late 2014 and just wanted to get something out there that was easy for people that were not technical to use. Um, and so, you know, a lot of our customers out there are, are, are not technical at all, um, you know, to the point where, uh, you, know, you know, PowerPoint is even more confusing to them than, you know, a lot of applications. So, 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 so our goal was to make, you know, signage very simple. Uh, and what we found that uh, was that, um, you know, th there's even IT shops out there that are in need uh, of this solution because the people using the, the, the solutions aren't necessarily the IT personnel. So you would normally have, you know, front desk admins or, you know, marketing department using this platform. And, and uh, what we found is that uh, a lot of feedback that we got is that it made a good fit, uh, you know, as a solution for, for, for those areas. Um, and so that's kind of where we've developed the platform. Um, every time we add a feature, we try to look at, are we making the, the, the platform too complex by adding this? Or how do we do that? So we make it easy for, for the average user that, that we expect to use the platform to use it. So are they just using your, your web-based platform, just for clarity, on whatever monitor that's available kind of thing? So there's, so you're providing the software platform and they're dealing with the other pieces on the other side? 
That's correct. Um, so our model is provided as a software as a service platform. Um, so generally, uh, we're hands hands off when it comes to hardware. We do sell a hardware device for for people that just want to plug it in and get up and going, but it's not required. Uh, we have apps that are available uh, in the uh, Google Play Store, Fire TV Store, uh, Windows installable players, and so it's kind of hardware agnostic. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Tom, do you provide uh, any content support, getting helping them get the content on these signs? Is that? We do. So one of the first things that's kind of a differentiator is early on, we, we developed a, a concept of templates. And we were one of the first people out there to kind of have templates that are readily available uh, within our platform. And that template library uh, ever since has been uh, expanding. And um, all, the, all the templates are HTML. So once we create one, um, for someone we can publish out there to the library for everybody to use and customize. Um, and it's, you know, it's just like, you know, Wix or PowerPoint where everything's drag and drop and can be fully customized right through your browser. Um, so, so, so generally if we have requests for templates, we have created some of those uh, at, at extra cost for customers, but then we generally say, we're going to use those as our template library. And a lot of them you know, are animated. We have holidays, we have different themes, news uh, that are uh, available within the platform as long as you're under a subscription. Do you, do you charge for those? Uh, we don't have a premium charge for those now. Uh, they're all under our paid model. So you have to be under a, a you know, paid program um, to, to get access to those after your free trial expires. Okay. You referenced a thousand plus companies using Mango Signs and I guess 2015 uh, founding the company. So from a revenue traction perspective, what do those thousand plus companies sort of represent today? So year over year, we've uh, maintained a minimum of 30% growth uh, year over year of monthly reoccurring revenue. Um, our churn rate is less than 3% um, currently. So uh, we've had you know, a pretty good traction. Uh, being that it was a, a side project uh, for a couple of years, um, the, the updates to the platform, most of them uh, happened, the significant ones happened within the last year and a half. Um, and now we're kind of poised to, to, to do a marketing push uh, now that we've launched um, a lot of the features that we kind of had been had on our roadmap, um, you know, prior to being able to, you know, bring out more resources to work on the platform. We, we relaunched uh, a little over a year ago on a, a platform 2.0 that we've been adding uh, a lot of the enterprise features uh, that, that, that have been on our roadmap since and just, just kind of got to the point where we um, launched our, our enterprise plan uh, a little over three months ago. Okay, got it. So you're probably just getting into a position here uh, fairly quickly where you'll have enough time that has passed with a critical mass of, of a customer base where you can start having more integrity in the subscription oriented metrics. You obviously reference churn, et cetera, and, and those types of things, but to have good data around that, which of course is always exciting for investors. <laughs> you'll, you, it sounds like you're pretty close to some of that information Right, right now, um, you know, we, we've struggled a little to find our uh, cost per acquisition uh, just due to the fact that we haven't done a, a true marketing push. Uh, most of our new customers have all been organic. You know, they found us through uh, minimal ad spend uh, or word of mouth. Yeah, but that's a good problem to have though. Yeah. <laughs> all right, uh, we had a question again from one of the mentors. Uh, how do you charge by company, by sign? What's the uh, kind of the, the, the unit breakdown of what you, uh, what a customer would pay? Sure, good question. We, we've been through um, a few different pricing iterations. You know, I, I can't say you know, you'll ever get it right. You know, there could be um, additions that we add on that we add uh, for additional uh, charge or, or cost. But uh, currently right now it's per sign. Uh, so we have three different tiers. We have um, a, a basic tier that's a pretty good plan for restaurants that have mostly static signage. Um, I mean, they can add animations and various things to the signs, but it's not driven by dynamic data. And then we have um, our, our premium plan, which includes a lot of live data streams uh, and video um, that can be streamed as well. And then we have our enterprise prize plan that adds uh, layers of being able to support multiple, multiple properties uh, under one plan. Um, so it's all per sign based on which tier you're in. Tom, is there any hardware you're reselling? Or, uh, or right now, you? yes, we do have an Android TV box we sell. Um, there's not much markup. We, you know, we add that as a convenience, more of a convenience that has the player installed. 
Uh, it allows the customer to plug that TV box into their TV, um, connect it to the internet, and uh, off they go. It's already got the software installed. We do have um, a recommended hardware page that we try to steer people towards hardware. We, we really want to be in the software business. We don't want to be in the hardware business. Yeah, I think that was the Achilles heel of the company Joy and I invested in. So I would highly recommend going there fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, two out of three panelists recommend. <laughs> Very good. I would agree. All right. Okay, three out of three panelists. We have a consensus here. All right, thank you very much, Thomas. I appreciate it. Uh, next up to a virtual stage, I would like to uh, welcome uh, Courtney Jackson, uh, who is the uh, the CEO and founder of Paragon Cyber Solutions. Uh, Courtney has developed a, or is developing a security compliance tool, and I will let her tell you a little bit more about that. Welcome, Courtney. Thank you, Ken. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Courtney H. Jackson, founder and CEO of Paragon Cyber Solutions. I would like to discuss the cybersecurity maturity model certification, also referred to as CMMC, and how our product will help federal contract companies streamline their assessment process. There are over 300,000 federal contractors in the US and over 4 million federal contractor staff. In 2018 alone, the US government spent over $550 billion on federal contracts. Currently, federal contractors have to comply with DFARS, which allows self-certification for compliance. With the new CMMC requirement, self-certification is no longer an option. Contractors must achieve formal CMMC certification in order to bid on and maintain, and maintain federal contracts. Most companies are aware that this mandatory requirement is forthcoming, but they lack the knowledge, time, and resources to achieve compliance. Enter our product, Paragon Security Suite. Compilation of scalable SaaS readiness assessment tools to streamline the CMMC process and prepare companies to achieve the mandatory certification. Our subscription-based model provides instant access for companies to get started immediately while providing continuous access to their assessment data. As a cybersecurity service provider, we have early traction with our current client base and our beta version will be available next month. Thank you for your time. I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you, Courtney. I appreciate it. Um, who has a question for Courtney today? Sure, I could, I could start. Um, just Courtney, is this, can you tell me how much this is, uh, are there services associated with the offering or is it 100% a compliance, you know, sort of readiness software tool or are you also going to offer the services around getting people ready? So this product is standalone. It doesn't require services, but we run a current services based company. So we have the ability to support them in that capacity. Okay, and you'll continue to you'll continue to marry that going forward. That's I mean the growth you expect to be in both the service and the product. Yes. Okay, great. Like a one stop shop. <laughs> yep. How much of your uh, service offering is automated, where you don't it doesn't involve humans to do these assessments? So with this product, it's completely automated. So a person that doesn't have any knowledge can literally click through, answer the questions, and we also provide guidance. If they click through and need additional details, it's built right into the system. Joy, any questions? Yeah, so I've, I've actually had uh, several conversations with Courtney um, about the product and about kind of what she's doing. Courtney, what, tell me again, like what the, the target client size is and um, kind of how you're going about uh, reaching those customers? So in terms of target client, uh, small to mid-sized businesses, in terms of reach, um, again, we do have current government contract clients. So we already have those in-house from services. And the fact that this is a mandatory compliance requirement. I mean, it's not optional. So mm -hmm. again, there's a third of a million people that have to comply with it. So we are gonna launch a marketing campaign um, outside of our current customer target market. So to, coming to Travis's question earlier too, have you run into any um, pushback in that you're providing the assessment tool and you're providing the services because sometimes there ends up being this conflict of interest, right? That 
you're the service provider and you're the assessment tool provider. And still yet there has to be an audit, right? That occurs at the, at the end of the day, because without the audit, the certification doesn't come through. Right. So we're on the readiness side of the assessment. So there's no, there's no conflict. Even um, on the services side, we would help the company to prepare for the CMMC certification. Mm -hmm. So this product is just on top of that. So how are you, how are you, char how are you charging? Is it a flat fee? Is, so, so for the product itself, is it a flat fee for the SaaS offering? Is it an ongoing subscription? Is there an either or model? Either or, so there's a, there'll be a monthly subscription and then they can pay annually as well. But there is an annual subscription requirement. I guess that's what I'm saying. It's like, there's a flat, is there a flat one-time fee option or is it, hey, I've got an annual commitment. You can either pay upfront for X amount of dollars or you can pay monthly. Right, it's the latter. So we, we haven't um, built out a flat fee where they just pay, you know, $5,000 and have lifetime access. Um, we haven't thought of okay. that. All right, great, thank you. Welcome, thank you. I got a- Go ahead, one, Mark. One of the questions, what, um, why wouldn't like MSSPs who uh, serve these DOD contractors, why wouldn't they just provide a, a service, um, you know, buy some off the shelf software, which I noted is available and do this for their customers rather than letting you in the door? Well, I haven't seen any off the shelf services that do it. There are other uh, mm -hmm. compliance assessment um, products out. Yeah. So with this initial one, we have the policies and procedures built into it. With R2, we're also going to add security awareness training and other things that would normally be an additional cost that would actually be incorporated into this subscription model. So they would save money in, in that aspect. So you're doing something beyond what a typical like propeller head guys people would do right exactly yeah. Courtney how complex is this how many questions how many uh, how many attributes if that's the right term for a company to get certified or to, to basically pass the audit uh, extremely complex uh, level three is the most common one that people will have to go after and it is broken out into practices and processes so there are 130 individual practices that they have to have in place ranging from access control awareness and a lot of different um, things that companies just don't have the capacity for or the know-how in-house. Okay, great. Any other final questions? Joy, are you pondering another one? No, I'm just, I'm, I'm thinking, I, I think she answered that correctly. If you look at the, Mark, to go to the end of, I don't, I don't know who asked, I think somebody in the chat asked that question, but to go through the full certification, it looks a lot like a PCI assessment. It's, it's extremely complicated. It's not simple. And, and it requires ongoing monitoring, documentation, process. I mean, all the, and that's where the, the recurring piece, the annual license is critical. It's not just for the ups, upfront certification and then on to the next customer, right. the long-term relationship with that client. Yeah, right. it's, it's the whole supply chain from end to end. All right. Got it. Once you get her in the door, she's never going to leave. That's right. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Courtney. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, next up, we have um, Doug Hill. Doug is with Real Random, a cybersecurity company. Um, waiting for Doug to be on the screen. And there we are. Doug, welcome to the stage. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Doug Hill, and I'm the founder of Real Random, a next generation cybersecurity hardware company. We are a team of five people with a combined 50 years of experience in software development and bringing new technologies to market. After six years of research, development, and testing, our technology is patent pending, and we are moving into pilot programs with companies that recognize the need for better security. In the early days of the dial of internet and AOL, standard security was math on a microchip. With e-commerce in place, hackers began to figure out how to reverse engineer the math behind that security. Like listening to the tumblers of a combination lock, Attackers can identify the math in the computer code that makes it vulnerable because it's predictable. As threats become more advanced, security must become more advanced. The solution, throw out the math that makes security vulnerable and replace it with true random numbers that can't be predicted. A market leader in website security, Cloudflare, decided to create their own source of unpredictable random numbers. They built a wall of lava lamps to record the random changes in the lava. 
those changes are processed and become true random numbers that replace the predictable math. It's neat and effective in improving their security. The problem is it's not scalable or commercially viable. What is needed is a scalable solution to support the next generation in cybersecurity. Real Random has developed hardware and software for a cloud-based system to deliver true random numbers that are impossible to predict. We are a design win built to support internet infrastructure security operations of companies like Amazon Web Services, Juniper Networks, Cisco, and Akamai. These companies help secure all the brands you know and love. We are seeking opportunities for pilot programs in banking, security, and transportation. It's time to get real about cybersecurity. I want to say thank you, uh, heartfelt thank you to Ken, especially. Um, he's really helped us in uh, recognizing things that we've been doing wrong for a long time. Um, to Tanya and her staff for all the emails and support, um, and in general, just the opportunity to be part of uh, all the great speakers and uh, guests that were in the program. Thank you. Well, thank you, Doug, and, and Ron, who's not on the screen right now for participating in the program. You guys were there uh, as a team every single week. Um, anyone in the panel have the first question for, uh, for Real Random? I'll go ahead and start. So um, I'm probably one of the only people on this call that understands that there's a market for random numbers. Um, I just read an article about the book of random numbers that came out several years ago and that it was actually not quite random. I don't know if you saw that article. The Rand um, book, yeah. Yeah, the Rand book. Um, but, I have it right here. <laughs> oh, you do? But uh, that was a big, I, I found it quite interesting. But so my question is, how do you identify uh, and target that market that needs these truly random numbers? So that's been a big part of our process and validation um, behind assumptions and uh, information we had in the past. Um, what, we've, what we've begun to do over the last 60 days is to interview um, what would be prospective customers to so understand better the needs uh, that they have around their overall security. And the uh, result has been, uh, we now have three pilot programs that are, that are starting. Um, and we were able to identify that it's not about the random number, it's what they need to do with the random number, why that random number is important to them. People don't really understand, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the need for true random numbers. And it's not for everyone. As Ken said to me the first week, your product is for the person that needs a 16 point harness because it's a drag race and they need to make sure that they're gonna come out alive. Um, so I've, I've been in the cybersecurity space for a while. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, we've, we've talked before, so it, it's not new. I guess my question would be, I actually got several questions. Um, so I saw you said the pilot programs are in process. Uh, and you mentioned some people that I'm very familiar with and have sold some of my companies to like Akamai and Level 3. Are you talking to them? Um, clearly, uh, there's a need for a solution like this inside of those organizations for sure. And they would actually Im implement it at the edge and they would resell it um, at the end of the day as an upgraded service to their client base. So are you having conversations with those people today? We are, and uh, I'm happy to say that we were asked by HashiCorp to build an integration uh, for their entropy augmentation program that they sell to enterprise clients. And so yes, um, you're exactly right. It's, it's a design win and it's, it's built to be a very important but small piece in a security tech stack. And then, so what, tell me what's been the, the biggest opposition. So if you're getting to the right people, which in that particular case you obviously are, What's been the biggest opposition to adoption? What are the concerns that they really raise about implementing a solution like this? Uh, well, if you want to take Entrust as an example, uh, okay. you know, okay, so Entrust's uh, CTO said to me, why would I pay for uh, true random numbers when I can get it from the uh, NIST Entropy Beacon for free? Um, to which I responded that that's uh, not an API, um, number one. So it's not something that you can use without, um, you know, a manual process in place. Uh, number two is 
it's not uh, uh, over TLS, so it's not secure. Someone else could very possibly easily see the, the numbers that you're receiving. So um, getting people to pay for it, I often say that what we have is like bottled water in 1990. That's what we have. I, I think honestly, um, I'm just gonna give you my two cents as we're going through this. I think if you get to the right people in a couple of these companies, say for instance in Akamai, um, your issue won't be getting them to pay for it. They're gonna make an offer for the company because they're gonna want to actually own the technology itself. I mean, I just kind of know how they work and um, I, I know how products get implemented inside those organizations. So I think that, you know, I would look, if I were in your shoes, I would look to establish a technology partnership. Um, if you could, perhaps with the revenue share model, I think that would be an extremely smart and lucrative long-term way to approach it. So that's exactly our model, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Can you talk just a little bit about, Doug, the, the kind of the payback period of the, you know, the, the hardware piece and, and, you know, the cost unit economics around that? Um, and if there, if, as the, you know, whoever the customer's buying and how long it takes for that to be paid back, there's, I'm assuming, some kind of a recurring stream in addition to upfront costs? Sure. Uh, I can give you a direct comparison. Um, and that is, uh, if you wanted to use, for example, um, a hardware security module, um, which our device uh, can be, um, uh, you know, considered one of the uses as a security module. Um, you want to use the cloud-based from on Amazon Web Services. Okay, uh, it's eleven $1 hundred and fifty dollars a month, and they sell by the by the hour. Okay, um, our cost to build one piece of hardware. Uh, our target build is $1,500. So in answer to your question, um, total capitalization uh, re recovery is six months. Okay. Great. That's a good, that's a good number. <laughs> yeah. The first machine was $125,000. The machine on my desk today was uh, 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 1500 so it's seven, seven generations of machines in six years. Wow. Right, but once it's implemented, it's not coming out. So it's, it's worldwide once it's thing. implemented. Right. <laughs> Great. Any other questions from the panel? Are we good? Doug, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you all. All right. Uh, and uh, next up, we have, uh, I'll wait for her to actually show up on the screen. Christina, there we go. Okay. <laughs> uh, next up, we have Christina Dills with Smart Edge Technology, who is going to be talking about a supply chain uh, and uh, logistics and analytics uh, platform that she has built. Christina, welcome to the virtual stage. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm Christina Dills, the founder of Smart Edge Technologies, and um, where I discovered through my experience at Microsoft working with distributors and retailers that mid-market retailers were being left behind to manage inventory and supply chain with um, you know, no available solutions that really fit their profile. So in today's market to manage retail, uh, to manage inventory, you have large enterprise solutions which are high-end implementations, they have very long deployments, they're overly custom with high price tags. And then on the other side, you have small business solutions which are very static systems they don't allow for many variations or integrations. So we set out to build a more robust turnkey off the shelf solution to take part of this $30 billion market. A solution that really provides inventory management and analytics with a scalable approach. We use RFID technology and a mobile inventory cart reader for simpler deployment that offer value fast. And in the last number of months, we've been working with customers to implement the system. And we've had a great experience so far with Goodwill and we continue to make progress. And in addition, we're in conversations with other mid-market retailers who have similar challenges. 
So we plan to leverage the work we've done with Goodwill and to scale across um, to create a more you know, out of the box experience for inventory management and analytics. So in terms of business model, we charge initial hardware implementation and then an ongoing monthly fee. And going forward, um, you know, we really do want to continue to bootstrap our operation until we move into the next level of creating a unique approach to the hardware. So with a positive track record at Goodwill, you know, we, we plan to expand to more locations there and we're also targeting apparel and cannabis retailers. So companies that are looking to optimize their supply chain, these technologies are now accessible in an affordable and a scalable way. Thanks so much. All right, thank you very much, Christina. Uh, Travis, do you have the first question? You're leaning into your monitor. Uh, <laughs> sure, happy to, happy to jump in, hopefully an easy one. Um, just, just kind of thinking about, I mean, you know, such, a, uh, su such an active industry, um, a lot of software products out there in and around this stuff, but you know, on the ROI piece, as you've had the one customer contract, the five deals in the pipeline, um, and you mentioned this ability, kind of the entry point and the features available. How are customers? Are they pushing you on ROI versus total cost of ownership, and and showing you know where the true economic benefit of the implementation is? Sure, uh, and that is definitely a topic that we've gone over uh, with that. So, and that's actually where we shine is that ROI because uh, the traditional, more legacy, I guess you could say, systems. Um, have a very long ROI to, uh, for RFID systems. So we've been able to prove ROI within the first year. So, um, and then some. And so in the case specifically for Goodwill, just in the back house, they're getting their ROI for the entire system across um, their stores of this franchise. So um, that's actually, you know, we, we really, that was kind of our main effort and kind of where I saw the opportunity at Microsoft these systems were five year, three to five year ROI. So we are actually able to give them that um, return um, within the first year. And, and the drivers are, are things around less, sur you know, less carrying of inventory on surpluses, less shrinkage, you know, some of the typical inventory management costs, that's where you're, you're, you're seeing benefit there? Exactly, so shrinkage, lost sales even, um, you know, a lot of inventory gets lost along the way. So that's another one. Um, so just in those two alone, like the direct impact, there's so many other indirect impacts that we didn't even, you know, consider. We wanted to show kind of where they're really direct, where they'll see the bottom line quickly. So focusing on those, they were still able to get the ROI within the year. Terrific. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Travis. Joy, do you have a question? Um, are there any specific verticals in the retail space that you're targeting up front? And, and if so, kind of why and, and how are those prioritized? Sure. So, I mean, we're going to continue with Goodwill because I think what we're doing with them is, is quite unique and they're a very large organization. But at the same time, we're targeting apparel and cannabis, mainly because they're, they're the ones that need more urgently that real-time kind of inventory management and logistics. Uh, because, you know, in apparel, you're constantly turning over clothing and cannabis as well. I mean, if you look at this industry, it's growing pretty quickly. They make great early adopters and um, they need to understand any, um, you know, bad products quickly, you know, close down on those quickly. And um, so those were the ones that actually um, in other ways have come to me and uh, through, you know, network or the network I have. And so that's when I saw you know, that um, opportunity in targeting them mainly. And what's your, what's your background your, before starting a company? So I worked at Microsoft for almost 14 years. And the last six years, I was working mainly with distributors and retailers. And um, I was the channel development partner. So we worked on everything, modernizing their business from digital to, um, so it was all about the digital transformation. Um, and so I was given the task to find solutions that we can modernize retailers um, to better sell their products that then better sold Microsoft products. And in doing that and talking to the top partners, I saw this gap. And so um, I had firsthand knowledge and I've been doing inventory reporting and analytics since I was in, an intern at Microsoft. And so that was where, um, you know, a lot of my background is in analytics. 
Got it. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Mark? Yeah, so I, um, we are in the process right now of implementing a, a small ERP system for a bike manufacturer that I own, but it's called Fulcrum Pro. I don't know if you've heard of it, but um, one of the big attraction for, for us was that it integrates with all our systems. So through APIs, our, our financial system, our, uh, our store, our supply chain, we can talk to vendors uh, that way. Is, it, is that the kind of thing that you're focusing on is that uh, kind of the API economy type solution? So um, it's not the primary focus. However, mm -hmm. we're trying to be flexible. So there's one system that we want to create, you know, we want to have like a fully, you know, we want to offer a full system, right? That, so we have partners that we're working yes. on that so that we can just easily have that plug and play type of, you know, experience for them. However, we don't want to be limiting to, especially with the stage that we're at. So um, we're making it a standalone system that then uh, we can build the APIs to integrate into anything. Easier. But it is cloud-based, your, your system, it correct? Is. All right. It is cloud-based. All right, any other questions from the panel? Well, just a little follow-up. Is, is there any uh, features and functions uh, that you have to match a specific market that makes your product uh, you know, very attractive to that market? Um, the market in terms of the, the retail market, yeah. the retailer. So, um, I would say the simpler deployment, our approach is, um, you know, they get that value fast. They don't have, if you, you know how it is to implement an ERP, even a simple one, these yes. deployment times take, they're very long. So what we've done is create a really smart way to do this quickly and come in and give them value fast and then build on top of that. And so that's kind of where I see us as that differentiator there. Um, because RFID and emerging technologies, it's, it's something that it's hard for retailers to, you know, fit that bill and invest in that, you know, and not see that, that return to pay for that investment quickly, especially in, in what's happening today. So we really do want to make, have that simple, you know, um, out of the box experience for them that I just, I don't see anywhere today. Christina, on the front end, what are the implementation costs for a typical customer? So on the front end, it's um, the, the bigger costs are, are the hardware, right? So uh, the readers, the antenna, the cart itself, but even then, um, you know, we've done it in a very economical way where we've kind of created this, we've pieced together this part um, and then depending on how many reading stations. So the card usually manages the warehouse. So we'll have the card to do that. Um, if they want to do in-house printing, they'll have a printer. Otherwise, they can pre-print on the tags. And then those tags can be um, put on pallets or in their warehouse or on the product level. And so um, that's what we've been doing with Goodwill is just kind of testing all of that out in these past months. And then, um, and then in terms of like the receiving area, so let's say they receive a, you know, a shipment, we have a reader there, antennas there, and um, that are scanning those, those tags coming in. So the front end you have, um, I guess, I mean, the front end, it's usually the readers, the antennas, and then in terms of the administration portal, it's just a kind of um, touch screen that's connected to the cart. And then they can easily kind of run the scans that way. And then on the back end, they can also run reports. Okay. Any other questions from the panel? Are we good? Thank you, Christina. I appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. All right. So that actually brings us to the end of our program. We went through that fairly quickly. Um, and I just want to make a couple of closing comments uh, and you know, thank you all for attending. But um, first of all, the success of these companies is not determined by the pitch they made to you today. The success is based on their ability to deliver and to execute on what they've promised and the customers that they've identified as their early adopters, the real targets for that technology. If you are a business that could be one of those early adopters, I wanna remind you, these are all local companies and they could use your support. They could use the feedback on what they've presented today and potentially uh, the, uh, the engagement around solving problems that you have in your business today to help them get to that next stage of traction and, uh, and validation for their market. 
I want to thank the panel for their great questions uh, and, the, and their participation today. I want to thank Mark uh, again for being not only a panelist, but for being one of the, uh, the influencers and inspiration behind the Accelerator Program at the Tampa Bay Innovation Center. Uh, we're on cohort number two, uh, and uh, I think it was a very, very successful effort of all these people coming together online in uh, very difficult circumstances to run this program and to uh, participate in this program without, uh, without actually having to commute anywhere, but uh, it still took a lot of time and attention, and I appreciate your support. I appreciate the support of all the different companies and all the guest speakers that we had uh, throughout the program. Of course, uh, I support, uh, uh, we appreciate uh, the, uh, the staff and Mike Mydell at Pinellas County Economic Development, who is uh, the, the backer of this program. Uh, and I, I couldn't uh, get away without uh, thanking Tanya, Joan, Mary, uh, and of course the board at Tampa Bay Innovation Center for supporting this program and uh, keeping the wheels on this as we uh, transition from a face-to-face -face environment to one that was entirely virtual. So with that, I wanna talk about the next cohort. We are going to be doing this again. We have plans for cohort number three to be starting sometime in the beginning of January. Uh, and to do that, we'll have to open up our applications probably in mid-October. So if you are a technology company or a friend of a technology company that is in the B2B market space that would like to take advantage of a program like this, I urge you to watch our social media, get on our email list, or contact uh, myself or Tanya directly for information on when those applications are going to open up. It'll be an online application and virtual uh, interview process. Uh, at this point, we plan on doing cohort number three virtual again doing it entirely online. Uh, we'll see where that goes. I do miss the happy hours. I do miss being able to get face-to-face -face with people for, for lunches. But uh, I think if you talk to some of the participants from cohort number two, doing it online, uh, we didn't miss a step. Uh, I think everyone got a lot of value out of the program. And I appreciate especially their patience of dealing with me over the last 12 weeks of going through this program, putting themselves out there, being very vulnerable to what their customers actually thought about their ideas, and then uh, setting some uh, very aggressive milestones for moving forward. Uh, with that, I am done and I thank you for your participation. If the panelists have any other comments, uh, thank you for being part of this. Thank you. Uh, and uh, and uh, Tanya, do you need to step in and say anything at the end or are we good? Is there any, any way we can, uh, maybe you can send out an email with a link uh, to the presentations online? Uh, or, yeah, I think we'd be yeah, happy to post that and make that available later. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, just once again, thanks to everybody for working with us. And we're very pleased to be able to offer this program to the local companies that are growing and creating jobs in our region. That uh, was very important to us. And then Mark and I worked a long time together with Ken to develop this program. And it's going to only get better as we continue because of your involvement. So we want to thank you for that. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. This wouldn't happen without the support of the ecosystem. Yeah, and I would just say that, you know, having been, I think I was week number two, Ken, I believe that I spoke in week number two, yep. the, the companies really have come a long way. So, you know, from kind of the earlier uh, part of this, so I was week two or three, so they definitely have, um, you guys have done a great job. They've done a great job, but, you know, Tanya and Ken and the mentors have done a really great job in helping these companies kind of hone their messaging and you know narrow their focus which is necessary in order to get some real traction at the end of the day yeah i think in every case you see a path to actually success you know where yeah. to joy's point you know at the beginning it was a lot it was very cloudy and you're wondering whether they're going to make it or not you know but uh, it's a very exciting to see where how far they've come and uh, and the path forward that they have well, you know, I like to say it's a path from enthusiasm to actual company uh, customer empathy. Uh, enthusiasm is great in the beginning, but you actually have to show that you've got traction and you understand who your market is. And that's where I've been adamant about making sure that they're out there doing those interviews uh, and hearing no a lot. All right, thanks folks, I appreciate it. Uh, we will make those slides available, but thank you very much. If you have any follow-up questions, feel free to email me uh, or contact me at the center. My email address is uh, evansk at tbinnovates.com. And uh, we'd love to hear your feedback. Thank you very much. Thank you.